Historians have to have evidence. Well, what kind of evidence do they look for? The best kind of evidence when dealing with ancient periods is to find evidence that goes back to the time itself. If you had some contemporary eyewitnesses telling you how Simon Peter died, that would be brilliant. Unfortunately, you don't have that. You would love, though, to have contemporary accounts written, written the, like the next day from the events. That would be great. Uh, historians would love that kind of thing. Historians would love to have lots of sources. You want to have lots of sources that go back to the time of the events that are being narrated. You would like these sources to be independent of one another. If, if you have 20 sources, but they all got their story from the same guy, you, then you don't have 20 sources. You have one source. You want, you want 20 independent sources who all attest the same, uh, to the same event. Moreover, you want these independent sources to be consistent with one another. You don't want them to be contradicting each other all over the map. You want them to be agreeing with one another. So you want them to uh, corroborate one another without collaborating with one another. Moreover, you want them to be unbiased toward the subject matter. You don't want them to be skewing things in light of their own self-interest. If you're an ancient historian trying to establish what probably happened in the past. What kind of sources do we have when it comes to the Gospels? The Gospels are our sources for knowing about the resurrection of Jesus. Are they the kind of sources that historians would want when trying to establish what probably happened in the past? I think the answer to that question is no. When were the Gospels written? Well, they are not contemporary to the events they narrate. Scholars debate when the Gospels were written, but by far the, the, the most common datings are that Mark was written sometime around 65 or 70 A.D., Luke and Matthew about 15 or 10 or 15 years later, John maybe 10 or 15 years later, so John maybe around the year 90 or 95, Matthew and Luke around 80 to 85. These are the dates that are taught uh, throughout the universities and divinity schools and seminaries of North America and Europe. I, th I take them to be right for reasons that I can give you if anybody really wants to know. It's a complicated argument. If these dates are correct, it means that our earliest account of Jesus' resurrection is 40 years after the event. 40 years after the event. Well, Paul was writing before that, wasn't he? Yes, Paul was writing before that. Paul talks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians. Well, that's 20 years after the event, so that's better. The Gospels give us the narratives. Paul makes reference to it, 20, but there's a 20-year gap. You don't have somebody who is there writing about it. Second point, none of the authors were eyewitnesses. Paul himself indicates that he was not an eyewitness, and none of the gospel writers was an eyewitness. People, of course, call the gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who wrote these books, and there's no point calling them Sam, Fred, Jerry, and Harry. I mean, they're, they're written by people we don't know who they were written by. They are anonymous. You might not think so because they have the title, The Gospel According to Matthew. Whoever put that title on it was an editor later. The original books are all anonymous, written in the third person. Moreover, the followers of Jesus were Aramaic-speaking peasants from Galilee, lower-class men who were not educated. In fact, Peter and, uh, and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Of course not. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write. And their native language was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated, rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition. Probably not disciples and don't claim to be disciples. Where did these authors get their stories from? Well, if they were not disciples of Jesus, they must have heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard them from somebody. Stories about Jesus, including his resurrection, had been in circulation year after year after year from the time that his disciples knew that he got killed and believed he got raised from the dead. They told stories to convert people. 
They improved the story sometimes. They changed the story sometimes. The stories got modified in the process of transmission over the course of decades before anybody wrote the stories down. These stories are based on oral reports that have been in circulation for decades. What happens to oral reports in circulation year after year, decade after decade? They get changed. What evidence do we have that the stories about Jesus' death and resurrection got changed? You can read the stories yourself. Simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death and then read John's account of Jesus' death and make a list of everything that happens in both and compare your lists. You will find that there are stunning differences. In fact, there are discrepancies. Let me give you just a list of very quick examples. What day did Jesus die on? That's a simple question. And luckily, we're told in both Mark and John. In Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus died the day after the Passover meal was eaten in Jerusalem. John tells us explicitly, chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus died the day before the Passover meal was eaten, on the day of preparation for the Passover. That's different. He couldn't die both days. What about the time? According to Mark, he died at 9 in the morning. According to John, he wasn't, he wasn't condemned to death until afternoon, John 19, 14. These are accounts that differ from one another. Did Jesus carry his cross the entire way to Golgotha, or did Simon of Cyrene carry it? It depends which gospel you read. Did both robbers mock Jesus, or did only one of them mock him and the other come to his defense? It depends which gospel you read. Did the curtain in the temple rip in half before Jesus died, or was it after he died? It depends which gospel you read. I can give you the references for all of these if you need me to, or you can look them up yourself. I'm not making these up. Those are just differences about Jesus' death. What about differences in the accounts of his resurrection? Well, who went to the tomb on the third day? Did Mary Magdalene go alone, or did Mary go with other women? Depends which gospel you read. If with other women, how many of them were there? What were their names? And which ones were they? It depends which gospels you read. Was the stone rolled away before the women got to the tomb or not? What did they see in the tomb? Did they see a man? Did they see two men? Or did they see an angel? Depends which gospel you read. What were they told to tell the disciples? Were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to see Jesus? Or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Did the women tell anybody? Or were they silent about it? Depends which gospel you read. Did the disciples ever leave Jerusalem? Or did they immediately, did they never leave, or did they uh, leave and go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. My conclusion, these are not reliable historical accounts. There are too many discrepancies. The accounts are based on oral traditions that have been in circulation for decades. Year after year, Christians tried to convert others by telling them stories to convince them that Jesus was raised from the dead, and they changed their stories while trying to convince people. These authors were not eyewitnesses. They're Greek-speaking Christians living many years after the fact. They're telling stories that Christians have been telling all these years. There was nobody there taking notes. Some of the stories were invented. Many were changed. For this reason, these accounts are not as useful as historians would like as historical sources. What I've given you so far is really just kind of child's play compared to the real problem of why historians cannot prove the resurrection. And this is what I want to spend my last three and a half minutes on, the real problem. Mike and I agree that what historians try to do is establish what most probably happened in the past. That is the task of history. You can't prove the past. You can only give evidence for the past, and some evidence is more certain than other evidence. All the historian can do is show most probably what happened. What are miracles? Miracles, by definition, are the least probable occurrence of an event. If a miracle was not 
least probable it wouldn't be a miracle. If somebody could walk across your lukewarm, the lukewarm water in your swimming pool, that would be a miracle. If the water was frozen, it would not be a miracle. But if it's lukewarm, I can tell you, none of you here could do it, and nobody in this world could do it. That's six billion people, so what are the chances of one person being able to do it? It would defy the way nature naturally works. I'm not saying that there are natural laws that are written down someplace that you can't break or you get in big trouble. Uh, scientists today don't talk about natural laws, but scientists do talk about highly predictable ways that, that, that this world works. And one of the way it works is that if you are a sentient human being trying to walk across the lukewarm water in your swimming pool, you won't be able to do it. What if somebody could do it? What would be the chances? They'd be, the chances would be infinitesimally remote that anybody could do it. Well, what if somebody could? Okay, let's say somebody could. The chances of them being able to do it are infinitesimally remote. Can you prove that this person probably did it? No, you can't prove it because you can't repeat the experiment of the past to show he did it. That's the problem with history. It's not like the natural sciences. The natural sciences work by repeated demonstration. And so, for example, if I wanted to show you that bars of iron will sink in that swimming pool and bars of ivory soap will float, all I need to do is to get 100 bars of both and start chucking them in. I'll chuck in 100 bars of iron, they'll sink every time. I'll chuck in the soap, they'll float every time. That gives us a predictive probability of what will happen the 101st time. That's how sciences work by repeated experimentation. Historians don't have that luxury. Historians can only establish on the basis of surviving evidence what probably happened in the past, and by definition, miracles are the least probable occurrence or else they're not a miracle. This creates the dilemma for the historian and is the reason why historians cannot prove Jesus was raised from the dead. Historians, by the very nature, establish what most probably happened in the past, but a miracle, by its definition, is the least probable occurrence in the past. The least probable occurrence cannot be most probable. This is the problem with the resurrection. Even if it happened, it defies imagination and cannot be accepted as a historically proven event. Belief in the resurrection. If you believe in the resurrection, it is for theological reasons. The resurrection is a theological assertion about what God did to Jesus. It is not and it cannot be based on historical proof. Thank you. Hi, folks. This is uh, Jason. Uh, we're looking at the minimal facts approach of the resurrection and uh, I'm going to be sharing with you the main arguments uh, for the minimal fact approach and I uh, hope this is going to be a blessing to you. So let's come before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day and for your love and your grace. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor and we thank you for all your blessings and all your care and all your grace and so God we praise you today we worship you we give you the glory and we give you the honor and we acknowledge that you are our God and we give you the praise and the glory today so father we thank you for this day we thank you for your love and we pray that you be with us today in Jesus name Amen okay uh, well look at um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 And we read the first 
10 verses. Now let me remind you, uh, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and still do now, for your faith is built on this wonderful message. And it is this good if you firmly believe it, unless of course you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me that Christ died for our sins just as the scripture says he was buried he was raised from the dead on the third day as the scripture said he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve apostles and that he was seen by more than 500 of the followers at one time most of whom are still alive though some have died by now then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles last of all I saw him too long after the others as though I had been born at the wrong time for I am the least of all the apostles and last of all I saw him too after the others as though I had been born out of the wrong time for I am the least of all the apostles and I am not worthy to be called an apostle after the way but whatever I am now it is all because God poured out his special favor on me so that's um, the passage that we're going to be looking at um, in the defense of the resurrection um, we have to ask one of the first important things that we have to ask is can we use the documents of the New Testament uh, as an argument concerning the resurrection of Christ now it's important to realize that we can use the New Testament you don't have to believe the Bible is the Word of God to believe that the New Testament can be a source of historical information and so you will find that historians even secular historians will look at various texts of the Bible uh, in the New Testament uh, critics will grant you a certain number of Paul's epistles as genuine Paul uh, critics will grant you that there are aspects of the Gospels that they regard as historically accurate now they might not agree with all the Gospels they might not agree with the entirety of the Gospels but the point is this is that historians do use the New Testament as part of their historical inquiry now what we need to do in the defense of the Christian faith concerning the resurrection is have a hypothesis of an idea of as to what of what we are stating and that hypothesis needs to uh, explain the data that would investigate it as we have a and we see whether there is data that confirms or disproves it um, from a historical point of view um, what we're trying to do is when we've had the hypothesis when we check it we see if after we've checked it whether again the facts substantiate what we have what, what idea we have So, first of all, we look at the evidence that is um, in the topic. We look at the evidence about the resurrection. And then we say, well, what would be the best explanation for that evidence? And then we determine various ideas that might fit that data. And then we choose the best understanding of that data and that is the minimal fact approach C. Uh, Bahan McClough M C K uh, M C C U L A A G H in his book Justifying Historical Descriptions gives us uh, a number of criteria to work on in our historical investigation 
Number one, the hypothesis together with other true statements must imply further statements descri describing present observable data. The hypothesis must have greater explanatory scope, that is, Im imply a greater variety of observable data than rival hypotheses. Three, the hypotheses must have greater explanatory power, that is, make the observable data more probable than rival hypotheses. Four, the hypotheses must be more plausible, that is, be implied by a greater variety of accepted truths, and its negative implied by fewer accepted truths than rival hypotheses. Five, the hypotheses must be a lead has hoc, uh, that is, include fewer new subs suppositions about the past, not already implied by existing knowledge than rival hypotheses. Six, the hypotheses must be disconfirmed by fewer accepted beliefs, that is, when conjoined with accepted truths imply fewer false statements than rival hypotheses. And seven, the hypothesis must be ex must so exceed its rivals in fulfilling conditions uh, to six that there is little chance of a rival hypothesis after further investigation exceeding it in meeting these conditions. So, if your hypothesis explains a wide variety of data uh, better than any other hypothesis, then yours is the most likely position to be true and it has to be said that when we're dealing with historical knowledge and historical knowledge is not the same as mathematical knowledge uh, that's important because you get some apologies from the atheist and Christian side who will try and use the Bayes theorem which is like a mathematical formula but we can't have certainty in historical knowledge we work on probability, trying to understand the best set of data uh, for the best hypotheses. So, in our historical inquiry, we're looking for whether our facts, whether sorry, whether our hypothesis has the facts for explanatory scope, explanatory power, plausibility, less ad hoc compatibility with known beliefs and that it can outstrip other rival explanations. Now there are in this hypothesis that Christ rose from the dead we have 12 facts that that are on the table before we even begin. Um, and we'll look at those facts in a minute. Now, we can know whether Christianity is true or not because it can be falsified. Christianity hangs on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the idea that Christ rose from the dead. All we have to do to prove that Christianity is not true is to provide the evidence to show that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So Christianity is falsifiable. If the Christian faith can be, if evidence can be given against it to prove that it still hasn't, Jesus hasn't risen, then that evidence can be provided. But if it's true, if Christianity, if Christ did rise from the dead, then evidence should be able to be provided to counteract those who would argue against it. But either way, it can either be proved or disproved. There is a criteria of uh, falsifiability in the whole application. Now, in a debate with Anthony Flew, Gary Habermas stated as to the what most scholars would agree, and Anthony Flew, an atheist at the time, agreed with these 12 facts. Fact number one, Jesus died due to the rigours of crucifixion. Fact two, Jesus was buried. Now I'll just unpack, he died to the rigours of crucifixion. Well, uh, Tacitus and Josephus verified that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Jesus was buried, uh, the Gospels link to that. Uh, his disciples, number three, doubted and despaired because Jesus' death challenged their hopes. 
and the Gospels and the Book of Acts point to that. Number four, the tomb in which Jesus had been buried was discovered to be empty just a few days later. Five, the disciples had real experiences that they believed were actual appearances of the risen Jesus. Six, the disciples were willing to die for the truth of these events. Seven, this gospel message was the very center for preaching the early church. Eight, the gospel uh, was proclaimed in Jerusalem, a city where Jesus had died. Nine, the Christian church was firmly um, firmly set forth by the disciples. Um, Ten, the day of worship was Sunday. Eleven, James the skeptic became a follower of Jesus. And twelve, Paul the persecutor became a follower of Jesus. Now there are a number of uh, arguments against the resurrection and um, the arguments against the resurrection some of the arguments can go like things the tomb was not known by the apostles but that doesn't take into account the facts of 4 and 12. Maybe the woman came to the wrong tomb doesn't take into con uh, consideration facts 5 and 12. Some may say it was, a re uh, it was a legend but this doesn't take into consideration all the facts from 1 to 12. And just uh, an aside there, I've checked uh, the history of Mithraism from 500 BC to uh, 600 AD and uh, it's it's uh, interesting to know there's very little documentation about these religious uh, beliefs that skeptics say was part of forming Christianity uh, Jesus could have had a twin but that would would not match with the facts 4 and 11 what about people hallucinating? How does that account for facts 5, 11 and 12? You have a variety of uh, experiences. You have individual appearances to, of Jesus to people and mass appearances. Uh, a variety of phenomena that's not normally associated with hallucination. And also, if it was an, an, an hallucination, then what is interesting there is it would that idea would not accord with the uh, Jewish concepts of resurrection. Um, they they knew the difference between a ghost and an hallucination an illusion and a physical resurrection. The uh, idea that if Jesus was a spiritual resurrection, it wasn't literally physical, uh, doesn't match facts 4, 5, 11, 12, and uh, is based on bad Greek semantics. Some might say that the resurrection body was stolen. This doesn't explain fact. Some might say that the body was stolen, hit by the authorities, but this doesn't explain facts 5 and 12. The idea that Jesus just died a little bit kind of like fainted um, but this discount doesn't fit with the facts 1 and 6 some might say there was a plot and this was all uh, a conspiracy 
doesn't explain facts 5, 6, 11 and 12. Um, one idea where it, all the facts fit is Jesus was an alien. <laughs> you could have that as a webitar. If you read uh, Gary Habermas and J.P. Moreland, page 127-128, Beyond Death, uh, basically the resurrection is based on the disciples, their experience. This experience is based on eyewitness material. This eyewitness material is difficult to explain away on naturalistic assumptions. These various experiences of eyewitness material were reported early um, making a, a very strong claim that that there was historical continuity that in the story that it, it wasn't just like made up and developed and rehashed by various editors and various groups but there was already early at the beginning of Christianity a, a consistent story of the resurrection of Christ also these people's lives changed There was a notable difference in their behaviour. James, who the Lord's brother, was converted and became a martyr throne uh, from the top of a synth, the temple. You know, he was a man who gave his life for the gospel. The facts that we have support the empty tomb. Um, you can't deny that the resurrection was at the heart of the early church teaching. It was the main teaching, central teaching. If it was central and it was the main claim, they would have thoroughly made sure what they were saying was correct. And what is most devastating and all against all the critics is that this clear teaching that they had about Christianity they preached it about his resurrection in Jerusalem that would be the last place you would preach it interesting to know the enemies of Jesus such as the Jewish hierarchy of the time were not able to present any evidence to overturn the resurrection the fact that we see the church how did Judaism develop into the church what was the mechanism for that happening? That itself needs an explanation that the skeptics failed to give. Then the church changing from worship of Saturday on to a Sunday. How did this happen? Something uh, shattering and momentous must have happened for Jews to do this. We see also that important things such as James, the brother of Jesus, a skeptic, became a Christian, followed Jesus. Paul, a blasphemer, became a Christian and trusted Jesus. As we look at these various evidences, we see that skeptical ideas do not explain the data. So the historicity or the historical veracity of the resurrection of Christ. And it's interesting to note that many scholars recognize the power of the minimal fact approach. Um, 
William Wand, uh, Oxford University church historian, says all the strictly historical evidence we have is in favour of it, and those scholars who reject it ought to recognise that they do so on some other grounds than that of scientific history. Now, one of the more powerful objections to the resurrection is Hume's uh, contention. And that contention is very simple. Uh, he would say that Basically, uh, miracles don't happen because nature just doesn't uh, uh, do that. We see a uniformity in the nature, and uh, we just don't see miracles happening. But David Hume developed a criteria to investigate miracles. There was a miracles claim, miracle claims during the um, French Catholics uh, in the time of Pascal. And these miracle claims um, Hume decided to go and look back in history and investigate them. He had a set of about five or six criteria and when he used the criteria on these miracles he said that he had to admit that they'd taken place and then he realized that well he had a more scientific explanation of miracles so even though the historical evidence shows that miracles took place at the time of Pascal um, and David Hume recognizing the power of this argument um, then goes and denies it on the grounds not of evidence but on the nature of science and, and contingency. I think that if you go to the quantum level uh, in physics you will find that things are much more complex and nuanced than we really thought. And so therefore to be dogmatic and say miracles have not happened when something in, at the quantum level could come into as this existence or work with nature to change a situation is a possibility. It should be an open possibility to study the interjection of our way of thinking um, so Hume is pretty easy to debunk by using Hume really. So he denies miracles not based on evidence but based on presupposition. So that's the minimal fact approach to the resurrection and uh, I'll be doing another video um, on another subject in a second. Thank you for listening and God bless. Question six, have the Gospels been accurately preserved down through the centuries? This is a uh, terrific question that I have been interested in for a very long time. My first interest in this particular question about the accurate preservation of the Gospels uh, started out when I was a student at Moody Bible Institute. At Moody Bible Institute, I believed, as did my professors, that the Bible is without error in the autographs. In other words, the originals of the New Testament did not have mistakes in them, even if subsequent copies of the New Testament may have mistakes in them. The problem is, we don't have the originals of the New Testament. What we have are thousands of copies of the New Testament that were made, in most cases, centuries later. We don't have the originals. We have copies made centuries later. These copies that were made centuries later contain numerous mistakes, thousands of mistakes, tens of thousands of mistakes, hundreds of thousands of mistakes. This was a problem for me at Moody Bible Institute, and I decided that I wanted to learn more about the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. I went to Princeton Theological Seminary to study with the foremost scholar in the field, Bruce Metzger. I devoted years of my life to this study. This has been the core of my research for the past 30 years. At some point I came to the realization that my belief in the inerrancy of the autographs didn't make sense. If God inspired the Bible without error, why hadn't he preserved the Bible without error? 
I couldn't think of a good answer then, and I still can't think of a good answer now, even though I think I've heard every answer ever proposed. I couldn't any longer believe that God had inspired the originals because I was sure he had not preserved the original. Let me tell you now what I think about this entire situation, which is that, the, that we cannot know whether the Gospels have been preserved accurately through the ages, and I'm going to try and illustrate with you by explaining how it worked. Take the Gospel of Mark. Whenever Mark was written, say it was written in the year 65 or in the year 70, in the city of Rome, say, I don't know where it was made, whoever wrote Mark put it in circulation and somebody copied the Gospel of Mark. Then somebody copied that copy and somebody copied the copy of the copy, then somebody copied the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy. And we don't have any of those copies. Everybody who copied the text made mistakes. Our first surviving copy of Mark probably dates to around the year 220. AD, that is, 150 years after Mark was first produced. Our first complete copy of Mark comes from the year 350, about 280 years after Mark. We have lots of copies from later times. From thousands of years, a thousand years after Mark, we get lots of copies. When you compare all of these copies with one another, they all differ from one another. And what is striking is that, that the, the earlier you go to look at the manuscripts, the more differences you find. The earliest copies have the most mistakes. What would happen if we found copies that were still earlier? The only evidence we have is the evidence that survives, which suggests that in the early periods of copying, there was the most mistakes made. How many were made the first month? or the first year, or the first decade. How many mistakes were made in the copy of the copy of the copy, which served as the copy of all the copies that we now have? We have no way of knowing. If Craig thinks that we have a way of knowing how the gospel was changed in its first hundred years, I want to know what the answer is. Because I've worked on this problem for 30 years, and I don't know of a way to know. And I've never seen a good explanation. You can't argue that, the, uh, that we have lots and lots of copies of Mark and therefore we know what was originally in Mark. These lots and lots of copies are from many centuries after Mark was written. How could we know that these copies stem from a correct copy instead of an errant copy? Our earliest ones are all highly errant. Sometimes you will hear Christian apologists say that the New Testament is the best attested book from antiquity and therefore you can trust it. It's true it's the best tested book from antiquity, but the attestation is all from a thousand years later. It doesn't make sense to say that you can trust it because it's well attested. If the New Testament was well attested, then you could say what the New Testament originally said. Whether you should trust it or not is another question. But the reality is we have lots of late manuscripts of Mark and of every other book of the New Testament. We don't have early ones, and the, er the earliest ones we have are filled with mistakes. Question number five. Do archaeologists and historians use the Gospels as sources? Uh, it's very easy to answer the question whether the archaeologists use the Gospels as sources. The answer is flat out no. Uh, archaeologists dig to find material remains from antiquity, and their digs are not based on the study of literary texts such as the New Testament Gospels, as any, and as any bona fide archaeologist will tell you. But historians, of course, do use the Gospels as sources, principally as sources for knowing about the life of the historical Jesus. They have to because there are no other sources that are reliable uh, that exist, which leaves us with a problem, since the only sources that do exist are the Gospels, and they're not reliable either. There's no doubt that the historical Jesus is the most important person in the history of Western civilization. There is no doubt of that at all, in my opinion. But the unfortunate thing about Jesus is that we have such scanty documentation about his life. Most people don't realize this, but Jesus is never mentioned in any Greek or Roman non-Christian source until 80 years after his death. There is no record of Jesus having lived in these sources. 
In the entire first Christian century, Jesus is not mentioned by a single Greek or Roman historian, religion scholar, politician, philosopher, or poet. His name never occurs in a single inscription, and it is never found in a single piece of private correspondence, zero, zip, references. The first time Jesus is mentioned in a Roman source or a Greek source is by the Roman governor of a province of Asia Minor, a, a governor named Pliny, in the year 112, 80 years after Jesus' death. And even then Pliny doesn't even name him Jesus. He simply refers to his name Christ in passing. That is the only reference within 80 years of Jesus' death. Jesus is mentioned two times, very, very briefly, by the Jewish historian Josephus in the year 93, over 60 years after his death, but he's mentioned in no other Jewish source of the first century at all. If you want to know about Jesus, you have to turn to Christian sources. There is no choice. The earliest Christian source is the Apostle Paul. But to the surprise of many Bible readers, Paul scarcely mentions anything about Jesus' words and deeds while he's living. He says a lot about Jesus' death and resurrection, but almost nothing about his words and deeds while alive. Which means if you want to know about the words and deeds of Jesus, the earliest sources are the Gospels. But these are filled, absolutely filled, with discrepancies, historical mistakes, errors, contradictions, stories that have been changed and rechanged and changed yet again in the process of, of uh, telling and retelling before the Gospel writers living 40, 50, 60 years after Jesus' life were able to write them down. Craig has said, well, eyewitnesses are still alive, so they'd be able to check the accuracy of the stories being told. I've never understood this argument, even though I've heard it for 40 years. Christianity started out as a small group of Jesus followers in Jerusalem, right after his death. Within 30 years, there were Christian communities that were established throughout many of the urban areas of the Roman Empire. There were Christian churches in Palestine, in Syria, in Asia Minor, what we think of as Turkey, in Greece, in Rome, possibly in Northern Africa, almost certainly in Alexandria, Egypt. Hundreds of people were converting. Thousands of people were converting. How did they convert? By people telling them stories about Jesus. Who was telling the stories? If I convert you, and you convert your wife, and your wife converts her next door neighbor, and next door neighbor converts her husband, and her husband converts a business associate who goes to another city to convert his business associate, who's telling the stories? Is it eyewitnesses? Are the twelve apostles of Jesus talking to everybody who's telling a story and saying, make sure you get that right? The eyewitnesses are probably in Jerusalem. Where are the eyewitnesses in Ephesus? Where are the eyewitnesses in Tarsus? Where are the eyewitnesses in Alexandria? They are not there. The stories are changed and rechanged over the years so that historians have to use these Gospels very carefully and critically because they don't contain eyewitness reports and we can't assume that what they say is historically accurate. Question number seven, our final question. Do scribal errors and textual variants significantly impact any teaching of Jesus or any important Christian teaching? Let me start by saying that when Craig says that uh, the following view is a view of skeptics, that we don't have the originals, we have only copies, that thousands of copies have thousands and ten thousands of mistakes, when he calls that the view of skeptics, it's true, that is the view of skeptics, and it's the view of non-skeptics, it's the view of every scholar who works in this field, including Craig. Everybody agrees. We don't have the originals, we have thousands of copies, and the thousands of copies have tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of differences among them. Are any of these differences important? Or are they all fluff? Did Jesus say, let the one who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her? It's a wonderful and familiar saying of Jesus, but it's based on a scribal variation that is an error. It was not originally in the New Testament Gospels, as Craig has just told us. Did Jesus say, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more? Well, does it matter whether Jesus said it or not? Turns out, it's only in a textual variant. It was not in the original New Testament. 
Did Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation? He who believes in me and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not will be condemned. It's found only in a textual variant. These are the signs that will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Does it matter if Jesus said it? It certainly matters to the Christian groups in the Appalachian Mountains who practice snake handling as part of their worship services. Did Jesus give the entire Lord's Prayer or just half of it, as in Luke? Does it matter? It depends on which manuscript you read. Or do other textual variants matter? Does it matter whether the doctrine of the Trinity is explicitly taught in the New Testament? The only verse that comes close to teaching it directly is 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. Does it matter if that's in the New Testament? Does it matter whether the Gospel of John ever calls Jesus the unique God or not? It's based on a textual variant. Does it matter whether the Gospel of Luke teaches a doctrine of atonement or not? The view that Jesus died for the sake of others. It depends on a textual variant. Does it matter if Jesus was in such agony before his arrest that he swept blood? It's found in only a single textual variant of the Gospel of Luke. Does it matter that entire words, lines, paragraphs, and pages were left out by some scribes? Does it matter that there are numerous places in the New Testament where scholars cannot decide what the original text said? Does it matter that there are some places where we will never know what the original author said? Does that matter or not? Many evangelical scholars claim that it doesn't matter. But I don't believe them because these scholars devote their lives to studying the Greek manuscripts. Why would they do that if it doesn't matter? Major evangelical seminaries raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for manuscript projects to study these manuscripts. Why would they do that if it doesn't matter? It does matter. Is the Bible a trustworthy, reliable guide? If so, what if we don't know what it originally said? For some people, these facts don't matter. And if you're one of them, well and good. But if you're someone for whom this does matter, then I would urge you to start reading and start thinking about the Gospels of the New Testament as critical scholars have described them. Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and I'll be okay today. Um, we're going to just be um, giving some uh, reflections on the resurrection of Christ and, and try to talk about whether there is any evidence uh, for, for the resurrection. So first of all, um, from the Rational Response Squad, um, we read these words, there's actually no historical evidence that isn't hotly disputed item within the field of history to prove that he ever was even a man, much less the Son of God. So what are my thoughts about that? Well, I think that that, uh, that, that, that statement really uh, shows really a lack of a, a lack of understanding of history uh, about Christ. There are facts about Christ which we're going to be looking at later that show that that um, that he died, that there was an empty tomb, etc., etc. And these facts are not in dispute. They're accepted by the main body of scholars. So, skeptics these days are propounding to you a bunch of lies. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 15, we read, If Christ was not raised, then your faith is useless. If Christ um, 
was not raised, we are false witnesses. As we look at the resurrection of Christ, we need to ask certain questions. Can we find a variety of sources? Is the testimony from enemies? Is there anything that at Irish Stock Inquiry that adheres to the criteria of embarrassment? Is there any eyewitness material? Is this material early? These are some of the questions that we need to ask in this discussion about um, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, Dr. Gary Habermas um, has compiled a vast amount of sources. I think it's over 14,000 as articles that he's looked at and that he shows that adhere to certain basic facts these articles are from Germany France etc and he's compiled a massive uh, encyclopedia of information about Jesus from these articles that's majority of them believe in certain facts about Jesus Christ So if we put these facts together, we get some amazing, interesting conclusions. If we looked at fact number one, recorded in all the Gospels, and in sources that are not Christian, the fact that Christ died on the cross, that he died. You have uh, Josephus, you have Tacitus, Lucian of Samosata, you have Mara, Bara, Serapion, and you have the Jewish Talmud. If that's not enough, um, I don't know what it is in the Jewish Talmud, it says Jesus was hanged. Hanging is a synonym of crucifixion. Uh, Tacitus and Josephus are accepted. Uh, faithful, honest historians. Um, the scholarship for Josephus, which I've noted many times to you, most will accept uh, most of what Josephus says as accurate concerning Jesus. Maybe a few words have been interpolated, but most will accept that there is wide historical support that Christ died, crucified, wasn't it not um, on Frey, the French philosopher, <coughs> who said no one was crucified <coughs> in first century <coughs> Jerusalem? And we found a first century uh, skeleton with a crucifixion nail through the foot, thereby showing the atheist philosopher on Frey hadn't got a clue what he was talking about. <coughs> John Dominic, John Dominic Crossan, um, Jesus, a revolutionary biography, page 145, said about Jesus and him dying on a cross that he was crucified is as sure as any historical um, anything historical can ever be. <coughs> Next,
one of the um, sources of evidence that the tomb became empty is enemy uh, testimony. There is an unwitting testimony by the Sahindran that the tomb was empty. They said it had been stolen, but that's a tacit ag acknowledgement of um, of enemy um, attestation. Uh, you can find in Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifol 108, Tertullian Speeches 30, Jewish Toledoth, he was not in his group. 11.15, you are not to say his disciples came during the night and you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. So basically there is uh, enemy attestation there. We can see that there were those who actually acknowledged that the body, the tomb was empty. We also see that women were testifying to the empty tomb. Now, Jewish women particularly were not accepted as important in the law courts for testimony, so why would the early church use women to testify to the empty tomb? So we've understood that the empty tomb uh, and then fact number three that there were appearances of Jesus now you find in the Gospels that they really believed the disciples really believed that Jesus rose from the dead one minute these disciples were bold uh, sorry, timid at the crucifixion of Jesus. They were timid and then afterwards they are bold. And we have to explain this historical fact. Now the main evidence uh, for this is um, Peter, Paul, John all stated that they had seen Jesus appear. We also have the 1 Corinthians passage which is the earliest historical material we have about early Christianity and what they believed. We can look at various um, traditional writers such as Polycarp, Irenaeus, also uh, tells us that they believed in um, the early disciples saw resurrected Jesus. Now, as a whole, whole literature outside the Gospels the talk about the disciples seeing Jesus rise from the dead we have the Didache, Clement of Rome, Shepherd of Hermas, Ignatius, Polycarp, Diognetus, Papias, Quadratus of Athens, Aristides, Justin Martyr, Claudius, Apollonius, Minicius, Felix, Melator of Sardines, uh, Hegespus, Dionysius of Corinth, Irenaeus of Lyons, Rodan, Theophilus of Caesarea, Theophilus of Antioch, Maximus of Jerusalem, Polycrates of Ephesus, Clement of Alexander, Tertullian, Serapion of Antioch, Apollonius, Caius, Philitus of Rome, and Origen. It kind of just goes on and on and on. Now when the disciples saw these appearances which we've been able to confirm by the Gospels and other literature and Paul's epistle, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, um, it had an effect. The, the 
these disciples became bold, they became contending for the faith in the very area that where they could have been disproved wrong, they were preaching in Jerusalem. So why? Why didn't anybody challenge them? So Jim Jones and David Koresh <clears throat> says this, nearly all scholars agree that the disciples of the risen Jesus that transformed their life. So we have three grand facts on the table, which there's tons of evidence for. Jesus died, the tomb became empty. So that's Jesus died, the tomb became empty, number two and three. Uh, the disciples saw appearances of Jesus. We see also in this that Paul was converted, a murderer, a persecutor, a Pharisee. We also see that James was converted, the Lord's brother. Both were unbelievers and yet they came to know and believe in Christ. So, these appearances were not only to the disciples but to skeptics. So, again, we ask the question, which view, which opinion takes into consideration the, all the facts? As we look at those various hypotheses, we see that they all fell to the ground. I think if you read uh, Norman Geisler, uh, Frank Turek, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, Crossway Books, Wheaton, um, page 299, we read Gary Habermas, skeptics must provide more than alternative theories to the resurrection, they must provide first century evidence for those theories. And again, uh, a number of a number of uh, theories that have come forward to try and compete is number one. You have the idea that the base theorem <clears throat> that you use the base theorem like Richard Carrier, and if we use that method, we can get to a better understanding of the resurrection. But the base theorem nobody uses in historical inquiry these days, or if they do, they're very rare. You have people like Richard Carrier also saying uh, that Jesus was a myth. Um, this cannot be substantiated because the Gospels are just full, are bursting full of historical facts, and it's obvious that. Uh, to say that Jesus is a myth is is just too simplistic and doesn't accord with the evidence. Also, that uh, one of the reasons for this myth idea is that it, Jesus comes from Mithraism. But if you look at Mithraism from 500 AD uh, BC to um, to 600 AD, there's hardly any literature that tells you what Mithraism is. So when people are saying that Christianity came out of Mithraism, it, it's very weak scholarship at best, uh, it's not even on the table really to, to be taken seriously and in fact no academic scholars in the historical Jesus studies takes those kind of ideas seriously. Um, Dominic Crossan has come up with the idea that Jesus was a kind of Sinic philosopher uh, in Galilee because we find Roman and Greek ruins but if you read um, the first essay by Dr. Evans in the Historical Jesus Studies uh, book, um, Cambridge Guide to Jesus. 
you find that he completely debunks Dominic Crossan by showing that uh, the funerary rites and the pots that we found all confirmed that Galilee was a very strong Jewish area. So, and there is no literature that we found of any significance that would prove that there was Sinaitic philosophical influence in that area. So, Dominic Crossan's ideas fall to the ground. Bart Ehrman would generally try to show there are contradictions within the goology and the methodology of many. If you read the book Inerrancy and the Gospels or Gospels and the Inerrancy by Poitras on John Frame's website, John Frame is a Christian philosopher, there you'll find a really good exposition of the various contradictions of the Gospels. But when one gospel says uh, an angel appeared, or another gospel says two angels appear, then you have to be careful because it's only the gospel showing different emphasis. And as we look at it in that perspective, there aren't any contradictions. Um, the other issue um, is conspiracy theories that maybe there was a, some kind of conspiracy, maybe uh, authorities stole it, maybe Jesus stole it, uh, maybe um, maybe his disciples stole the body. Well, either way, why would the disciples be preaching in Jerusalem Jesus rose from the dead if they stole the body? It doesn't make sense or even if the authorities stole the body. Um, so it just doesn't make sense at all. Um, some people have said over the years that Jesus could have just fainted, that he kind of like nearly died, uh, and it looked as if he was dead. But can you honestly believe that a half emaciated Jesus would turn up with oars in his hands, almost dead, try to gasp him for breath, and then tell his disciples that his disciples were going to Jerusalem preaching a resurrection. Do you really think that's a plausible hypothesis? In the ancient world, if you were crucified, you generally died. It's very rare that you didn't die. So, Looking at it from a, a medical point of view, um, there is clear evidence that he died in terms of the blood coming out of the stomach with the water. The idea that maybe Jesus had a twin brother is just not plausible. We have no evidence of that. Um, that Jesus, uh, that it all happened through an alien, uh, is some of the craziest stuff people have said. It actually is that really a plausible explanation. Fact of the matter is, there isn't any hypothesis that is better than the explanation that the Christian faith has that Christ rose from the dead. It rules out every other possibility. Again, the only strong argument that you could use is the argument, argument that miracles don't happen, that David Hume used, but that is debunked from the, because of the quantum level. We don't know what goes on at the quantum level. So to be dogmatic like that is just not being intellectually honest. So you're left with strong evidence that points to Jesus rising from the dead and I would recommend um, going to Gary Habermas's website on the resurrection I would recommend that you go to Mike Lacona's website on the resurrection and I would recommend that you read Lee Strubble's The Case for Christ and also if you want to read more scholarly information the Resurrection of Jesus by Mike Lacona.
So I hope this has been a blessing to you and an encouragement to you and a help to you today. And so God bless you and uh, see you soon. This is Pennsylvania Inside Out on WPSU TV. Here's tonight's host, Patty Satalia. Best selling author and New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman has rattled the rafters of Christianity. A graduate of the conservative Christian Moody Bible Institute with a Master's of Divinity and a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, he now chairs the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's the author or editor of 20 books on early Christianity and the history of the Bible. He's also an agnostic. In his new book, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why, he picks apart the Gospels that made him a disbeliever. We'll talk with him about current debates over Scripture and about why he came to regard his earlier faith and the perfect inspiration of the Bible as misguided. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Your book, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why, explores how scribes, through both uh, omission and intention, changed the Bible. Uh, but before we find out how the New Testament came to be what it is today, I'm a little bit curious about what the impetus was for writing the book. Uh, well, this is a field of study that uh, I've been engaged in for 30 years. Uh, when I started off in my research, I got interested in the New Testament and especially uh, how we got the New Testament. Uh, and the thing that, that struck me after working on this for about 30 years is that uh, people at large don't know anything about this area, even though it's, it's so important. Uh, many people just assume that we got the Bible by, I don't know, the, the Bible descended from heaven one day a few weeks after Jesus died. But in fact, uh, it didn't work that way. We, the, the Bible was copied over decades and then centuries, and we don't have the, we don't have the originals. We have copies made uh, many centuries later, and, and there are differences among these, these copies. And so this is something that scholars work on, trying to figure out what the original said, given the fact we don't have the originals, but only mistaken copies. Uh, but what occurred to me is that nobody uh, had ever written a book for a popular audience for this. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write something that would be understood by people who don't know the original Greek language or other ancient languages, but simply want to know about how we got, how we got our New Testament. You wrote in the introduction of the book that this was the, the most important books of any, to you personally, of any that you'd written, and there are some 20 in all. Um, it's been on your mind, as you said, for the past 30 years, since your late teens when you first began studying the New Testament. Tell us a little bit about your own personal religious journey. Well, I, I, I was raised in an Episcopal church, uh, but when I was in high school, I had a born-again experience and became an evangelical Christian, uh, which is why I went off then to Moody Bible Institute, which is a very uh, conservative fundamentalist Bible college, uh, which I enjoyed at the time. And uh, th this was a place that emphasized that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. There are no mistakes in the Bible of any kind. Uh, and uh, that's what I accepted then for, for a number of years. But then as I went on after Moody and went, went to uh, another college, went to Wheaton College to do my bachelor's degree, I learned Greek. And I started reading the New Testament in, in the original Greek language. And I started being troubled by the fact that we didn't actually have the original text of the New Testament. Because it, it started making less sense to me to say that the words of the New Testament had been inspired by God if there are places where we don't have the words. Because why would God bother inspiring the words so that we would have them if, in fact, he hadn't preserved the words that, that we really would, would have them? And so this, this started uh, me uh, fo forcing me to rethink a lot of my, my evangelical beliefs. And it, it started leading me away then from fundamentalist Christianity. In fact, you said you lost your last shred of, of faith while you were teaching a class at Rutgers. How painful was it for you, in a way, to have suddenly realized, I don't believe what I've believed for all these years? Right. Well, it, it, it is ex extremely painful, or what was extremely painful. It's not painful anymore, because now I, I really think that I, I have a better insight into the world and into people and, and our, our place in the world. Uh, and what actually led me away from the faith wasn't so much the problem with the Bible. Uh, what led me away from the, uh, from the faith was the problem of suffering in the world, that there's so much misery and suffering in the world that I think can't be explained if, in fact, there's a good and all-powerful God who's in charge of it. Uh, and that, that happens to be the subject of the, uh, the next book, the one I'm writing right now, in fact. We get another important book to me.
Uh, it was very painful for me, though, because uh, in part I had been thinking for years and years that if you, if you didn't have the beliefs I had, that you would uh, spend eternity in hell. Well, uh, that's, that's a very deeply rooted kind of belief. And if you no longer then are in the fold and you've left the fold and you have this belief in eternal punishment, that, that can be very painful, obviously. How were the 27 books of the New Testament cobbled together and by whom? And if they are not accurate, uh, are we talking about heretics or, or orthodox who made the changes yes. that, that you've pointed out? Well, the, the, the thing to recognize is that in early Christianity, there were lots of different books written by lots of different Christians. Uh, we, we know the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there were other Gospels written by other people. So we have, today still, we have Gospels allegedly by Jesus' disciple Thomas, by Philip, by uh, Judas Iscariot now, just recently discovered, Mary Magdalene, a, a whole range of Gospels, probably about 40 Gospels that didn't make it in. And so the question is naturally, why did we get these four and what happened to the others? Uh, as it turns out, it's not what most people think. Most people think that there must have been some kind of church council. Uh, you know, some people think that the Emperor Constantine called the Council of Nicaea to have a vote about which books would be in the New Testament, but it didn't work that way. Uh, the Council of Nicaea didn't take any vote about the, about the books of the New Testament, nor did any other council. What happened is over time, there were different Christian groups that had different sets of beliefs. And these different groups were trying to win converts. And eventually, one of the groups succeeded in, uh, in establishing itself as the orthodox way of looking at, at the religion. And this is the group that ended up writing the creeds that continued to be recited down to today. And this is the group that decided which books would be in. Uh, and so eventually, around the end of the fourth century, so about 300 years after the books had been written, around the end of the fourth century, most Christians uh, of the orthodox persuasion agreed on these 27. You say that the Gospel of John, the cornerstone of the Christian faith, which really explains his life and, and resurrection um, and death, you say that it is very different from Math, uh, Luke, and Mark. How so and why is that important? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are sometimes called the synoptic Gospels because you can, you can actually put those three in parallel columns next to each other and, and see the same stories and read the stories against each other. With John, you can't do that because John has so many different, different stories. Uh, and the question is, why does John have stories not found in the other three, and, and why doesn't it have the stories that are in the other three? And what, what scholars have uh, thought for many centuries, in fact, this is an idea that goes back to the early church, is that... John is the last gospel to be written, and it's, it is less concerned with giving historically reliable information and more concerned about giving a theological un understanding of who Jesus is. And so even in the early church, John was called the spiritual gospel because it was so different from the other, the other three. In, in misquoting Jesus, you cast doubt on any number of New Testament uh, stories, episodes that uh, are really sort of the cornerstone of, of Christian belief. Uh, one example, one of the most famous stories in the Bible deals with a, a crowd that's ready to stone an adulterous uh, woman to death, and Jesus leans down, doodles in the dust, and then says, let the one without sin cast the first stone. The crowd backs off. You say that that story is likely fiction. Well, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I didn't come up with this idea. In fact, uh, scholars have known for uh, several centuries now that this story, which is, I think, probably the most popular story in the Gospels, this story wasn't originally in the Gospel of John. Uh, the, this isn't just a, an opinion. Uh, th the reality is that we have uh, a lot of manuscripts of the Gospel of John, and in none of the early manuscripts can you find the story. Moreover, we have church fathers who wrote commentaries on the Gospel of John in the early church. We don't have any Greek commentators. It was originally written in Greek. We don't have any Greek commentators on the Gospel of John who mention the story for a thousand years. So, uh, so the question is, wh where did the story come from? Who added it and why? Yeah, well, we wish we knew. But my, my hunch, uh, and again, this is a hunch that a lot of scholars who work on this have, is that, uh, that there was a scribe who had heard the story, maybe heard it through the oral tradition, and thought that it, it well represented some of the things Jesus was saying in John chapter 7. And so he wrote it.
noted as a marginal note in the manuscript. And then a second scribe came along later and saw this marginal note and thought, oh, he left out a story. And then he put it in his manuscript, and then that manuscript got copied over the, over the centuries until it became a popular story and then was, was included in our English Bibles because it was included in the King James translation. Now, in researching your book, uh, you spent years reading texts from the Old Testament. We're talking about in ancient Greek, without punctuation, without capitalization, thousands and thousands of pages. How arduous an ordeal was that? And <laughs> yes, well, it's not for the faint of heart. It's, uh, this, is a, this is a difficult field of study, uh, but a very important field of study. And, and uh, it's, uh, there, there aren't that many people who engage in it because, in fact, frankly, it's rather boring. I mean, <laughs> reading Greek manuscripts is not the most exciting thing you can do on a Friday night, but, uh, but it is extremely important because the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And since we don't have the original manuscripts, all we have are later manuscripts, we have to look at these manuscripts and compare them with one another to know where there are differences among them. And what most people don't realize are that there are there are thousands and thousands of differences among these manuscripts. Well, somebody has to find these differences and, uh, and point out where, what they are so we can know well, what are the differences and what, what are the originals. And that, that's what a textual critic does. This is Pennsylvania Inside Out. I'm Patty Satalia, and our guest today is a New Testament expert. He's chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a best-selling author and an agnostic. Some say he peered so hard into the origins of Christianity that he lost his faith. We're talking with him about two of his books, the New York Times bestseller, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why, and truth and fiction in the Da Vinci Code. A historian reveals what we really know know about Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and Constantine. Uh, Constantine, let's talk a little bit about the Da Vinci Code, um, which of course is a worldwide bestseller translated into 44 languages. I believe there's something in the neighborhood of 60.5 million copies out there, so this is something that has uh, caught the attention of people worldwide. Um, the premise of this book is that there's a conspiracy within the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and the Vatican knows it's living a lie, but it continues to do so to keep itself in power. What do you think of the basic premise of that book? Uh, I think it's a brilliant premise if you want to sell books. And I think it's a, it, this is a, if, if what you're looking for in a book is a, uh, a good murder mystery that's a real page turner that has a Vatican cover up, uh, this is a formula for success and it obviously succeeded quite well. And so I actually liked it a, a, as a novel. Uh, the, I, I, I don't like it in terms of its literary style. I mean, if you want to read, if you want a literary stylist, read Jane Austen. Don't, don't read Dan Brown. But, but, but as a page-turning novel of the beach, I think it's very good. Uh, the, the problem with the novel is that it's based on historical claims, and uh, the difficulty is that virtually all of the historical claims in the novel are wrong. Uh, and so, uh, which, is, which is okay because it's a novel, but the problem is that Dan Brown begins the novel with a statement of fact where he lists a number of things that he claims are historically accurate. And he says in this, this list of facts, he says that all descriptions of uh, artwork, architecture, sacred ritual, and documents are, are accurate. Well, it's, uh, it's simply not true. And it's not clear if Dan Brown doesn't know it's true, not true or whether he simply just made mistakes a, a lot do of mistakes. Do most people who read Dan Brown's book and who saw the movie based on that book, do they look at it as history or do they look at it as a fiction? I am surprised uh, going around the country giving talks on the Da Vinci Code, which is about the only thing I talked about for about a year, uh, going around to audiences where people really were misinformed about some rather crucial things. Uh, I mean, th there's the controversial issue about whether Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, and it's not that people are reading that and taking that as historical fact, but they are they are wondering about it. Uh, could it be? Could it be fact? Uh, and uh, but but things like the idea that the Emperor Constantine called the Council of Nicaea, and there was a vote there to decide whether Jesus was the Son of God or not. That sounds plausible to people. Well, it's absolutely wrong. Uh, or the, the idea that uh, at the uh, Council of Nicaea, they decided which books would be included in the New Testament. Absolutely wrong. A and other things that, that are in the book. Uh, for example, that you can find some of the Gospels, some of the lost Gospels, were discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
absolutely wrong. <laughs> and so, so you could just go point by point by point by point through this thing and, and show that, that there are just these historical errors. So I, what, what I tell my students at Chapel Hill is that if they want to learn about the history of the Middle Ages, the way to do that is not to watch Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail. <laughs> and if you want to know about the history of early Christianity, you don't do it by reading Dan Brown. In, in fact, you've told your students in class that it's not enough just to believe what your parents believed. Blind faith just doesn't work, which well, many people think the foundation of religion is a certain degree of blind faith. Well, I, I think that religion is based on faith, but I don't think faith has to be blind, and I don't think that it has to be irrational or unintelligent. unintelligent. I think you can have a, an intelligent faith which, which questions the premises of your belief w without necessarily threatening your belief. You could continue to believe, but be an intelligent believer who asks good questions and looks for hard answers rather than simply accepting what everybody's already told you. I mean, if everybody accepted simply what everybody told them, then everybody would, I mean, where would we be as a world? We We'd would, all be the same religion, probably. Yeah, <laughs> right. And there'd be no need for universities any longer. So, uh, so that, for me, teaching religion in a, about religion in a university is an ideal situation because students come in with, with ideas about religion, and they, these get challenged, and so it forces them to think. I, th I think that's a good thing. It's probably uh, what you've written a lot about probably makes people very uncomfortable, and I'm wondering if people are able to uh, separate the message from the messenger. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think some people are better at that than others. Uh, I, I sometimes get hate mail. It's interesting that I've, the most hate mail I've gotten over the last couple of years hasn't been about um, the Gospel of Judas that I was involved with, uh, with the publication of, and or with uh, or, or some of the other or misquoting Jesus. Uh, the uh, mo most people have gotten upset uh, really because of uh, a particular stands that I take on the inspiration of the Bible. So uh, my view about the inspiration of the Bible is that um, the, uh, the, the Bible ha has to be treated like any other book is treated, because it's a book. And so if you're going to read a book, then you should read it as a book. And uh, you shouldn't prejudge the issue about what kind of book it is, any more than you prejudge any book. You read the book, and you see what's in the book, and then you, you, you evaluate it with your intelligence. And I think doing that, I think the Bible is, is the classic of religious literature. I mean, it's, it is the, uh, I mean, for good reason, it's the best-selling book of all time. But uh, the Bible needs to be read carefully, and uh, people need to read it critically. Otherwise, people simply use the Bible to support whatever their own particular points of view are, and I don't think that's very helpful. In fact, critics say they should read your book, but read your work balanced against against other religious scholars. Absolutely. Absolutely. You shouldn't take anybody's word for it, even mine. <laughs> now, you know, there have been several books that debunk uh, Dan Brown's uh, enormously popular The Da Vinci Code, uh, but most of them have been evangelicals who have been worried that his work would lead people astray. Yes. What's your motivation? Well, it's not that. Um, I think you, you do get a lot of evangelicals for whom that's a concern, and you have, actually get a lot of Roman Catholics who have the same concern that, that their, their uh, co-religionists will be led astray. My, that's not my, my interest because I don't have a religious uh, a commitment in, 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 that, that is involved with this. Uh, my, my problem is that I think history is really important. Um, I think we really need to know what happened in the past. And anytime people misunderstand the past, it affects the way they understand the present and probably what, what they're going to do in the future. I think that certain things matter about the past. I mean, it really matters that there was a Holocaust, even though people, some people want to deny it. It matters whether there were weapons of mass destruction discovered in Iraq. Uh, things about the past matter. It matters who Jesus was. He's the most important person in the history of civilization. We ought to know who he really was. Uh, and so I think it's very important for people to know history. And so I wrote my book on the Da Vinci Code as a way of getting back to very important historical issues concerning Jesus and the New Testament and so forth. Now, you talk about the New Testament as being copies of copies of copies translated over you know, lots and lots of years. But how does it compare to the Muslim Koran or the Jewish uh, um, 
Torah? How, how does it compare in terms of accuracy? And well, I'm not an expert on either the, the Quran or the, or the Torah or, the, or all of the Jewish scriptures. What I will say is that in the ancient world, everybody had the same problem, which was that there, was, uh, there, there wasn't desktop publishing, and you couldn't publish anything electronically, and you didn't even have Xerox machines. Uh, you didn't have carbon paper. The only way to get a book reproduced in the ancient world was by copying it by hand, one page, one sentence, one word at a time. And until there were tight controls over that, uh, people made mistakes. Uh, now, eventually, in, in Islam and in Judaism, in the Middle Ages at least, there were tight controls over how scribes reproduced things. But there weren't tight controls early on in either religion, and there certainly weren't tight controls in Christianity. So when you look at the earliest manuscripts of Christianity, uh, the, the scriptures of Christianity, and compare them with one another, there are mistakes all over the place. You know there are mistakes because you can compare two manuscripts and they differ from one another. And so, uh, so you have this, this problem that people are changing their text, and then the question is, what's the original text, what got changed? And it actually is a big problem with the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's as big of a problem as it is with the New Testament, with the one difference being that the Hebrew Bible doesn't have very many manuscripts, whereas the New Testament has thousands of manuscripts. And on that note, unfortunately, we are out of time. Yes. Our thanks very much to Professor Bart Ehrman of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for talking with us today, and to you for tuning in. If you have comments about this program or have story ideas you'd like to share with us, you can reach us via email at pennsylvaniainsideout.psu.edu or by U.S. mail at 227 Outreach Building, University Park, Pennsylvania, 16802. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Patty Satalia. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111. Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you. Um, I just want to share with you um, There are, there is a sort of major school of textual criticism that goes right back to the 19th century, uh, which is Westcott and Hort. And basically, Westcott and Hort said that the oldest manuscripts are the best, and that means we've got uh, ancient manuscripts of the New Testament from the Alexandrian school of, of copying. Um, however, at the time of Westcott and Hort, there was also a belief that the vast majority of texts that we have of the New Testament were from the Byzantine school of copying. But because these texts, uh, we begin to have a lot more of these texts in the maybe 9th century onwards, uh, it was regarded that these texts even though the, the majority of the New Testament are from this kind of school, that they are not the oldest. And so textual criticism went down the line of Westcott and Hort away from the Byzantine text. So where does that get us? Well, what that gets us is that modern scholarship will say, well, the last ending of Mark is, is not in the early uh, manuscripts, therefore the last ending of Mark is, is not Mark. However, what the modern scholars don't tell you is 95% of 
the ancient manuscripts that we have of the New Testament do have the last ending of Mark. So what I'm trying to get at here is that there is a school of textual criticism that the modern scholars are not letting you know about. A school of textual criticism that scientific way of looking at textual criticism. Um, now an article, uh, a very extensively researched article by New Testament textual critic Maurice A. Robinson is called the New Testament textual criticism the case for the Byzantine priority. He writes from the beginning of the modern critical era in the 19th century the Byzantine text form has had a questionable reputation associated it was with the fact the faulty Textus Receptus edition which stemmed from Erasmus or Eximus on critical selection of a small number of late manuscripts here after MS scholars in general have tended to label the Byzantine form of text late here it is late and secondary due to both to the relative age of the extant witnesses which provided the majority of its known support and in the internal quality of its readings as subjective we perceived Yet even the numerical basis of the Byzantine text form rests primarily upon late um, minuscules and unicels of the 9th century and later the antiquity of the text reaches at least as far back as its predecessor exemplars of the late 4th and early 5th century. So basically what Maurice A. Robertson is, is saying here is that modern textual criticism, rejection of the Byzantine text as being more helpful for the reconstruction of the New Testament text uh, is faulty. That actually we need to take more seriously the Byzantine uh, text, not just because there's more of them, uh, but for very good reasons that they are actually do go back to uh, later antiquity. So he write, he reads in his Conclusion: Every variant unit evaluated favorably from a Byzantine priority perspective, and all its units should be units should be carefully examined when attempting to restore the original text. End of quote. So that's an article that you can go and read. It's called "The New Testament Textual Criticism: New Testament Textual Criticism: The Case for Byzantine Priority." So I would encourage you to go and read it. It's an extremely difficult article to read. Uh, but if you're interested in textual criticism, that's a very helpful place uh, to start. Also, um, there is uh, an interview with Maurice Robertson, part one by David Allen Black and part two. So go and have a look at that interview with Maurice Robertson, part one and two, David Allen Black. Uh, class to the congregation with a Greek famili familiarity course on the side. We lay persons were urged to purchase various interlinear Greek New Testament which gave us the benefit of a complete Greek New Testament text with a literal English meaning for every Greek word and a brief but complete lexicon and significant for text critical purposes a collection of variant readings adopted by 19th century scholarly editors. The existence of those numerous variant readings um, made me encourage my curiosity and I wondered which reading was correct or incorrect and why. Some editors preferred one reading but others chose to remain at various points with the TR. I knew nothing of manuscript text types or text critical principles. All I knew was the what appeared in Berry and he stated that the various editors cited the footnotes each had published an edition of the New Testament, Greek New Testament. And he goes on to, to say how he got into this textual criticism. He goes, is your case for Byzantine priority prompted by theological reasons or inerrancy or divine preservation? 
He goes, short answer is no, the long answer is more complex. Following my conversion, I have become convinced of the reliability and authority of scripture. I then basically held to a somewhat inerrant uh, viewpoint. Certainly my view regarding scripture drove my interest regarding both its original language and the question of which readings were original. At that time, the readings my the readings my theological views approved were not those of the Byzantine text form or the TR, but the predominantly ex Alexandrian variants cited in various footnotes and in the main text of the UBS edition. Certainly, my theological presuppositions did not compel a position regarding a traditional form of the text, nor a preference for any specific manuscripts or text types, nor what variant readings should be preferred at any given point. Even today, my view of biblical inerrancy is not affected by my text critical viewpoint, nor does my view regarding inerrancy determine my text critical viewpoint. In theory and actual historical practice, any text or manuscript can be accepted as God breathed and theological sufficient for teaching and for proof in, in instruction of righteousness. In other words, such MS and texts exist as valid witnesses to biblical authority, despite various non scribal errors or disagreements among them. In this regard, no MS or text fails in its aggregate to reflect an authoritative witness to God's written revelation of truth. Tre textual criticism exists primarily to sort out the differences and out of many reasonably good and accurate texts to determine more precisely which sequence of readings appears most closely to reflect the original form of the text as given by re revelation. What are the criteria for determining the date of reading the Byzantine text? Let me return the question. What are the criteria for determining the date of any reading as opposed to the date of an existing witness? The only certainty is that a reading appearing in MS is either older than the MS or created by the scribe of that MS. A reading found in 2nd century MS is certainly at least that old, but not necessarily any older, necessarily original. Equally, a reading in the 12th century MS might be old and possibly original according to some textual critics. Most critics acknowledge that most readings found in MS of any era, regardless of text type, have demonstrable existence in NS versions or fathers dating from the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Carlyle and others rightly posited that except for late singular or near singular readings, all meaningful variants are old and originate before AD 200. Readings dated solely on the basis of MS age do not carry very far when attempting to determine the autograph or original reading. So that's just a little bit about the Byzantian uh, school of textual criticism. And so I'll read again the titles of these articles and uh, you can go and research it. So basically when you're hearing modern scholars today talk about textual variants, remember there's a different school of textual criticism that's not he heard much in the halls of academia and it's a very solid scholarly school that's being ignored. Defend the Bible in a better way. And I think Morris A. Robinson can help you in this. New Testament textual criticism, the case for the Byzantine priority, Morris A. Robinson. And then if you also type in interview with Morris Robinson, part one, David Allen Black on davidblackonline.com. Okay? And there you can read part one and there's part two of an interview with Maurice Robinson. So there we are. Um, I'm doing textual criticism in the canon at the moment because I'm just looking into it in a deeper way.